reality of the Caribbean, the Caribbean right? Yet, yes. yet, yet, large companies are making a lot of money. So can, can we explain that? I mean, business context-wise, we're kind of a mess. We have to accept that. Okay, our SME sector is not competitive. The large corporations, in spite of making money, they are not competitive. And that actually has a very clear macroeconomic effect that we're all suffering. Jamaica is suffering. Barbados is suffering. Um, I, I could think that, uh, if you allow me, um, the title of the book is Sclerosis, right? I think it's multi sclerosis. More than that. <clears throat> but, yeah, but, but there is some hope. However, just let me just tell you a story. I know I have 10 minutes. Okay. It will take 60 minutes, 60 seconds to tell the story. But imagine a company, let's just assume a chemical manufacturing company, let's call it in uh, Trinidad Tobago. It uh, basically produces one chemical, very wide, widely used in clinic products. It's the only manufacturing plant of that particular chemical product. Unfortunately, I cannot share the name of the company because it's confidential, but this is an actual true story. Um, when sitting down with the CEO of this company and, and, and the chief operating officer, um, and by the way, it's, it's a subsidiary of a large, large corporation or a conglomerate, I asked them, well, um, what is the variety of products that you have? We only have one product. So you manufacture one product. Excellent. And uh, your competitors, how many competitors do you have? We have none. We basically package this same product to five different brands. We have our own brand, and there are other four brands that basically are distributors that they have their own brand and they sell it everywhere. Uh -huh. And are you making money? Yes, we're making money. Are you, are you proud of what you do? You basically have a monopoly. Actually, a monopoly is the wet dream of all entrepreneurs, isn't it? <laughs> So you're living the dream, man, I told you. But how come there are no competitors? How come you can be the only producer of this particular chemical for all the countries? Is it just magic? Is it so difficult? How difficult it is to kind of produce this thing? Actually, you can find it. OK, I, I asked the, the manufacturing manager, how long did it took you to learn the process? Well, it took me two weeks. And then I asked, well, can you explain why we don't have competitors? Well, again, just don't tell this very out loud. But there, are, there is a non-tariff barrier. The little thing that, the little trick is that in order for a competitor to, or for anybody to import this particular chemical, uh, we here at Trinidad Tobago ask this chemical to have 20% more concentration that how this chemical is produced all around the world. So that in itself actually creates a formidable barrier because no producer in the world will like to change their process just to export to Trinidad. So what about this move, man? We're good. And then the conversation turned, well, so market dominance. Market dominance as a, uh, this is more, okay. Does this thing work? Can you make it work? It's the, it's the clicker, right? What's it? Mr. Sierra, I think the doctor's here, actually. In any case, they don't have anywhere else to, 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 to grow. No more. Perfect. No more growth space. The only growth space that they have is Trinidad Tobago. If they want to go abroad and start exporting this particular chemical, they have to get rid of the, of the non-tariff barriers, open the market, and then guess what? They will be screwed. 
Excuse my French. It's Mexican, by the way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of why, it's part of the story of why these large firms keep making money in these particular markets. Um, we have, and I call that the market dominant strategy. The market dominance strategy. But before that, let me just describe that this, this is a project that is funded by Topic Caribbean. It's called Large Regional Firms in the Caribbean Drivers of Growth and Opportunities for Expansion to New Markets. The objective of this study is to understand and document the growth strategies, trajectories, and patterns in large regional Caribbean firms, typically more than what, 500 employees in all these countries. Done. I did. Okay. Now, this is how we, we, we've done so far. We're just beginning. And um, I would like to share with you what is the very first question that I ask every single CEO that I met. I met basically with uh, about 30 CEOs from the largest companies in all these different countries. And I've, had a, I've asked a very, it's a very simple question. Mr. CEO or Mr. Chairman, you know, in the last two years, what has been the product, the most exciting, innovative, original, singular, rare, different product that you have launched in the last two years that have created extraordinary value for your, for your customers, not only in your home country, but in other countries as well? That's the first question that I ask. What do you think is the answer? The answer is exactly that, silence. They, it's a very uncomfortable question. OK, then, if you don't have an answer, just explain me. What percentage of your sales last year came from products or services that didn't exist before? Just you know. That silence. So. Dr. Sierra, let me confirm your findings as well from, from the part of, uh, uh, of the um, opinion of the CEOs. Market dominance you know, is about having a bigger slice, a slide, a slice sorry, of the same pie. The pie is not growing. As we try to get a bigger you know, slice of the pie, OK? What happens with SMEs? SMEs get, tend to get crushed. We start to compete in based on price. Okay. When markets don't grow, you know, the small, medium enterprise sector as well tends to be crushed. Whenever a company has to compete on price, it's, it, it's a reflection that they're basically competing on the basis of the same value proposition. I call it the, the sameness syndrome. Okay. At the end of the day, SME entrepreneurs are competing based on the premise that they can live a more miserable life than their competitors. That's competing on price. Does that make sense? Now, market development is to try to grow the pie. There are some companies, some large companies that are trying to do that. A lot of companies here in Jamaica are trying to do that. Race Canada is one of them. They're trying to, you know, diversify their markets. And this is a very important aspect of, of, of the growth trajectories of firms. Can we ever expect to have very large companies in the Caribbean, based in Caribbean markets? Let me give, give you one piece of good news for large firms. You are large. You are big. You have a lot of employees. You sell a lot. No, I'm going to give you bad news. You are a large company in a minuscule market. It's nice that you're big. But if a company your size, we move it from Jamaica, and we put a company your size in um, Colombia, maybe you will be a little bit between small and medium. Or what about if we move you, you to Florida? Well, you become small. 
But the other interesting aspect is that especially conglomerates, they're really the aggregation of the small businesses under the same, the same corporate umbrella. Does that make sense? So um, market development is, is something that is actually happening. There are a few companies that are trying to do that. But even fewer companies that are in the pattern number three, which is using this market dominance, which you know what is a typical internationalization trajectory that happened in cement, that happened in all, many other businesses, where, for instance, the Mexican company Cemex used market dominance okay, as the primary platform for growth abroad. Now, Cemex is operating in more than 35 different countries. Okay? But the problem is that this pattern three, you can barely find it. Whenever you, you have market dominance, you kind of get into an arena of complacency in the Caribbean. Now, in terms of trajectories of growth, talking about geographies, well, you have the typical country-centric conglomerate. Uh, for instance, Agostini Holdings in Trinidad Tobago is typical. They, they're not interested in going abroad. They are into the super, they have a little bit of uh, supermarkets. They have a few pharmacy stores. They are into uh, distribution of, of uh, pharmaceutical products, distribution of uh, construction and building materials, but they are not interested in going abroad. Then you have Caribbean centric, which is the second trajectory, which is what happens with most conglomerates. Yeah, the Neil and Massey's and so on and so forth. Um, a, a few, a few um, GMB, right? A few banks. And then you have trajectory number three, which is companies using the Caribbean as a platform for global growth. So anybody can actually name one company that uses the Caribbean as a platform for global growth. Jamaica producers, Jamaica producers one. Grace, Grace yes. Yeah. Do we have a lot? Sandals. Sandals? Yeah. But unfortunately, this trajectory number three is extremely small. Yet, it might be the most important. And you know, Sylvia actually, uh, the director of Compete Caribbean, told me, Miguel, are these trajectories really relevant? Are these like part of kind of a life cycle? Should we first be great locally, then in the region, and then try to be relevant um, in other North Korean markets? Is, is that like a kind of step one, two, three, this is the recipe? The answer is no. You know, actually, the only way for Korean companies to really grow substantially, double digits, exponentially, not in percentage-wise, but in degrees of magnitude, is actually growing outside the Caribbean. Does that make sense? Even if you have a monopoly of bottled water in Jamaica, you all condemn to be small. Okay? Now, there's other type of growth strategies which are a little bit more sophisticated. I call it uh, uh, growth generic strategies. We have three different uh, strategies that are dominant. One is integration and value chain steps. Uh, I don't know where, can you, can you see? Yeah. So, <clears throat> The integration of value chain steps is basically forward or uh, backward integration. Is whenever a company, let's say, I'm into uh, building houses, I move from building only building houses to producing cement. That is actually backward integration. Now, talking about cement, TCL, right? Everybody talks about TCL. Um, I, I was with, uh, I, I've been reading, I don't know, if I've been studying the case of TCL, Tiran Cement Limited, right? Um, and if you think about it, the cement uh, business, the cement industry, is quite controlled, right? There's a lot of control, uh, there's a lot of protection in the cement. But then, I was talking to a few, a few, a few people over there, and I asked them, well, you, what, are you, what are you most proud of? What they say is that we produce the best cement in the world. Okay. And who are your competitors? We don't have competitors. Okay, so you have a great product. You have no competitors. Why are you losing money? Anyway, they were kind of a little bit of a shame. But the point that I want to make is that cement companies right now 
are moving from being product centric to basically create solutions, not only providing cement, but actually helping in the design of housing, in actually executing the construction, in actually providing not only cement, but the other building products um, as well. So this is a typical growth strategy for large companies. They like to acquire. By the way, conglomerates, large firms, really love inorganic growth acquisition. We're very bad at organic growth. We love um, acquisitions. So that is the first, the first strategy. The second strategy is really what I call value deployment through your channels. So we have our product, and we try to push our products everywhere we can. You know, let's sell containers to Solutia. Let's kind of uh, try to sell this product not only for kids, for teenagers, and try to push my product without modifying the product to basically new geographies, new channels, or new customer segments. Now, there's a big problem with that. You know, these, the left side of this graph is about deploying value. The right is about creating value. Unfortunately, most of large companies in the Caribbean are very bad at this part of creating value, especially in innovations through new businesses and new products. This is a very small uh, effort. It's a very small percentage. And I, will, I invite you to count in any annual report that comes in your hands the number of times that the word innovation is mentioned versus the word risk or the word efficiency versus the word opportunity in any annual report. You will be surprised how, little how few times the word new is mentioned. You will be surprised how much the word cost, efficiency, and risk is mentioned. Usually the rate is between 1 to 10, 1 to 20. So that tells a lot about the mindset of, of people, right? And especially from management. So, um, and the, the strategy number three is just let's keep doing our business as we are, which I call it the old growth business or the old growth strategy. Now, what is the implication for, the, for an old growth strategy? Well, this is some of the patterns that we have found. Companies in the Caribbean that actually grow doing the same thing, basically they focus on market penetration, replication of the same products in different, in different um, locations, and operational effectiveness. And if you ask me, that's 89% of their strategy. And the other is in organic growth, which finding ways to acquire companies, whether it's non-opportunistic or opportunistic acquisition. Uh, most of the growth happening in large firms in the Caribbean is old growth, about 90%. And the rest is what we call a new growth, which is operations in new locations, conquering new customer segments, new product services, or new business models, that's the, part, the organic part, or joint ventures of M&As in of new value chain steps. Now, other interesting things that we have found in this, uh, in, in this study is, is the role of the location of the headquarters. Well, usually you have a Caribbean headquarters that serves a Caribbean regional uh, market, right? Like Kansas Macau, Sajipur, Guardian, and that's a kind of the typical uh, <clears throat> recipe. But I'm pretty sure that you have heard that there is no Caribbean headquarters or no Caribbean business headquartered somewhere else outside the Caribbean where they sell the Caribbean region mostly. One is PALIC, Pan American Insurance, which is based in uh, New Orleans, but their actual market is the Caribbean. So they're based in New Orleans. Unicomer, you know Unicomer, what is Unicomer? Courts? You know where is head, where's, where's the, where the headquarters of Courts? El Salvador? And the other is Gother Pattering Group. Well, they have a, a, a headquarters in Barbados, but the Cameron, <coughs> the Cameron headquarters is based in Miami. It's, and let me just talk a little bit about Goddard. I think that Goddard is really the most global company in, in the Caribbean. They have operations in Uruguay, Paraguay, Ecuador, Colombia. Quite interesting, right? 
They have operations in 16 different countries. And let me tell you, they have even operations in Venezuela. They have operations in Venezuela, which is quite surprising, uh, especially in this context. So um, this is very important to understand because I think that these companies are really the ones who will start to challenge a little bit more these all Caribbean headquarters, right? And then we have other very interesting companies who have a Caribbean headquarters, <coughs> but serving non-Korean regions like SM Jalil, Grace Kennedy, and again, Barbara, right? So the location of headquarters really tells you uh, a, a lot. To wrap up, um, I think that these, these are kind of the biggest lessons that I, uh, that I learned in this study so far. First, in growth strategies for large firms, it is the risks that basically dominate the, the, the strategy more than the pursuit of opportunities. Avoiding risks more than the pursuit of opportunities, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, for sure, efficiency all the time beats the heck out of, the, of, the, of innovation. You have the efficiency projects, you have innovation project, and the, the efficiency project will eat it in, you know, just in one shoe. It is interesting how innovation is so low in the rankings of, of, of uh, priorities. If you ask any CEO of any of these large companies if innovation is an important priority, the answer will be yes. And then if you ask, how do you innovate? There will be an interesting silence in there. It is unbelievable what, how much it is in terms of this obsession for short-term profits. It's an obsession. And Google the meaning of obsession. Just, just. It's obsession. Long-term is not that important. What matters is short-term profits. Actually, profits are much more important than growth. Okay? Profits are much more important. But the other interesting thing that I have found in many companies is the following. If a general manager of a subsidiary puts forward an innovation or a new, a new business that entails some innovation, the returns and the growth that they expect coming from that is, are actually completely irrational. Okay, you want this 100 million? The IRR has to be at least 35%, my friend. At least 35% internal rate of return. Otherwise, don't come here. So good luck finding you know, an IRR of 35%. So it's quite interesting. So uh, to wrap up, there's, there's hope. Indeed, there is a lot of hope. There are companies in different parts of, of, of the Caribbean with great projects like, imagine building 2,000 units of new houses you know, with a price point of 30,000 US dollars. It's happening. It's not in the English speaking Caribbean, it's in the Dominican Republic, but it's actually happening. Uh, <clears throat> A virtual credit union. Imagine a credit union, but for the whole Caribbean. Well, it's something that is starting to happen in Trinidad and Tobago. <clears throat> Imagine, as well, insurance products for the base of the pyramid. Well, that's exactly what Palette is trying to do. Or imagine that leveraging all the sophistication of financial services in the Caribbean, we could start a global market of community trading. Okay, we don't have commodities, but we do have trade. We're in power. So there are many, many interesting projects that are happening now, and we're looking forward to finish this. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, in the Caribbean, we don't, we, it's not only about growth. It's about growth with high economic multipliers. Okay? And this is very important. Not all growth has the same impact in the economy. So one of the most important parts of directing policies for growth is to push the growth 
especially the private sector, in sectors that have high economic multipliers, like construction, for instance, or like manufacturing. Okay? Thank you very much.